Hi, everyone, and welcome to the show. This is episode number 97 of Pop Culturally Deprived, and today we're going to be talking about Disney's The Hunchback of Notre Dame on your Dang It podcast. I'm Mandy Kay. And I'm Matthew Vose. We are now coming much more up to date with our Disney movies. We are in solidly into the Disney Renaissance era. Uh, mm-hmm. So this is uh, almost a surprising one for you not to have watched. It's not from before you were born. <laughs> uh, it is a time when you were watching Disney movies yeah. and and have watched Disney movies since again from this era. So how come this is one you've never seen? Because it wasn't a Disney princess movie and I wanted to watch Disney princess movies. That's fair. Although I think that Esmeralda is technically a Disney princess now, which doesn't make any sense to me. But No, I don't think she is. No? Okay. No. <laughs> okay. That actually makes me feel better. I'd be amazed if she's ever guest starred on Sophia the First, frankly. <laughs> that would be a weird conjunction. <laughs> Have you ever watched Sophia the First? No. Okay. Yeah. It's no. not bad. It has its moments. Okay. Mostly, you know, when like Ming Na Wen turns up, so Oh nice. Mm. Okay. So yeah, this week we are talking about the hunchback of Apparently, it is Notre Dame. <laughs> Notre Dame, yeah. <laughs> Even though I am from the American South, where I've always heard it, Notre Dame. <laughs> but since they actually said Notre Dame in the movie, I'm trying to mm. like rewire my brain to say it that way. Ugh, these people who speak other languages. Ugh. Right? Can't they all just speak <laughs> American? <laughs> <laughs> Nottingham. <laughs> God, it sounds so weird when you say that, but it yes. sounds so normal yes, when it I does. say it. No, no, it sounds normal when I say it. <laughs> oh, language. It's wonderful. Mm-hmm. Okay. So The Hunchback of Notre Dame is Disney's 34th feature animated film. It is a musical adaptation of Victor Hugo's work of the same name. The voice cast featured Demi Moore, Kevin Klein, Jason Alexander, and David Ogden Steers. It was the fifth highest grossing release of 1996, and Alan Minken's musical score was nominated for both an Oscar and a Golden Globe. And it's also got Tom Hulse as Quasimodo. I don't know who that is, so yeah. Ah, you haven't seen... Because he's most famous for, I think, uh, Amadeus. But yeah, was, wasn't that. he in Parenthood? Yeah, he was the, the younger brother in Parenthood. Oh, that's right, because I remember you telling me, mm. this is the guy who was an Amadeus. Yeah, he was, in fact, Amadeus. Okay. Yeah. I didn't recognize the name, um, so to me, he didn't have quite the same okay. power as Demi Moore or Kevin Klein. But he also played the main character. <laughs> I feel we should mention him. Just Okay. <laughs> we, he has been mentioned now. Okay. <laughs> So according to IMDb, this movie is about a deformed bell ringer who must assert his independence from a vicious government minister in order to help his friend, a gypsy dancer. Which is not entirely correct, because Frollo is not a minister. (laughs) He's Uh, a judge, right? No, I think he does hold a ministerial position to clamp down on the city in some way. Minister of Justice. Mm. Here we go. Ah, okay. Okay. Yes. Yeah, because as much as it is called The Hunchback of Notre Dame, it's not really about The Hunchback, certainly this adaptation. Mm-hmm. It is much more about Esmeralda, which is uh, in uh, the book was originally called, um, oh, let me get this right. Let me look it up. It, it's called Notre Dame du Paris, which is obviously referring to the cathedral itself. Mm-hmm. But in English, that translates to Our Lady of Paris. So it's also about... Esmeralda herself, and the passion she awakes in all the men. Hmm. Well, that's interesting. So, yeah, so saying saying it's about Quasimodo having to you know, find his independence and so on, I'm not sure that it is. Yeah, I'm... This movie has a lot of themes in it, and none of them are really specific to a character. Hmm. It, it's more emotions or movements Mm -hmm. you know it's about darkness and it's about freedom versus being enslaved it's about racism (laughs) yeah it's about misogyny you know it's it's not really about any one of these characters yeah if i had to say anything it would be when the minister for justice seeks to destroy the you know, Romani people, 
And right. particularly Esmeralda, Quasimodo, his ward, steps in to try to save him. Something along those lines, but mm-hmm. even that's exactly like you say, it does not cover it all. Anyway, we're, yeah, we're strange. getting way into it already, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> so, Matthew, how did you watch this one? Uh, I had to rent it on Amazon because it's not available anywhere for some reason. Same here. Mm. Yeah, here it's just on Amazon. I, it used to be on Hulu and it has been on Netflix, but it no longer was, alas. Which, which I think might speak to where this sits in the Disney canon. I, I can't think of a single thing I've really seen at any Disney park to do with uh, Hunchback or Quasimodo. There's a reference on Wikipedia. He is a very rare character you can meet, which mm. I can't think I've even seen pictures of it. I don't think there's any rides. It's not one they particularly do much with. Mm-hmm. That's not surprising to me. No. just And I know we're, we're going to talk about this a little bit later, I think, but this is one where apart from Quasimodo and Esmeralda, I did not know what any of the other characters looked like in this movie. I had never heard a single song that was in this movie. So this movie is just not one that's been widely known, mm. maybe. Maybe maybe not widely known, but it, it hasn't permeated the world the way that Ariel and Little Mermaid has or yeah. Belle and Beauty and the Beast. Like, you just don't walk around singing these songs. No, no, you don't. And so it makes sense to me then, because if if there was a ride at Disney World or Disneyland, it would be much more familiar, Mm. I think. Mm. I think that's the point that I'm trying to make. Yeah, no, completely agree. Um, So uh, that's this film in particular, but what's your knowledge of the the source material and the Hunchback in general? Oh, there is none at all. I've I've never read the book. I, I only know that it exists because it exists in pop culture i mean there is a disney movie called that so i knew it was a thing um but i i really did not know the background okay so you've never seen any other adaptation of it Mm -mm, that kind of thing and when you say pop culture references do you mean that line from buffy (laughs) i mean there aren't too many references to this even in pop culture no i well i mean i think it's just because I am aware that this exists in the Disney line. Okay. I think really that's what it is. If Disney had never made a movie called this, I probably would not really be aware that this was a work by Victor Hugo. Hmm. Honestly. Okay. I've not read the book. I do like Victor Hugo. Les Mis is a terrific read. But Mm -hmm. he is very heavy. You know, he does take several chapters just to explain to you the misery and suffering of everyone in, in his story. And then he gets into the plot. <laughs> My mum has read it and she basically said, yeah, don't read it. You've got, you're bang on exactly what it's going to be. Uh, but there, okay. the, I, I do, I have visited Notre Dame Cathedral. Um, and I do also have a picture of me in front, from about 15 years ago, to be fair, but in front of Avenue Victor Hugo. Because I felt okay. I should. Hmm. I didn't know there was a such thing as Avenue Victor Hugo. Oh, they have a lot of streets named after a lot of people. It, it, okay. Like I'm saying that as well, oh, those kooky French naming streets after people, as every city <laughs> does, obviously. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, no, I got it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so the hunt track of Notre Dame, did you enjoy it? Oh, no. Oh. Not even a little bit. It's been a while since we've had one that you were absolutely no. Yeah. And I like... I'm I'm really struggling with this. Like I've actually been reading today some like essays online about people who love this movie and think it should absolutely be a Disney classic just to see if I can get a different perspective. But I think I messaged you right up front that I was having a hard time even just watching this movie. It was painful. I hurt my heart. And then it was just wildly inappropriate in places. <laughs> and then it hurt my heart some more. Yeah. And I just can't get past a lot of the problematic aspects of this movie okay. i think yeah you did start watching it and then appear not to watch it for a couple more days what? that actually was had nothing to do okay <laughs> with the movie itself i started watching it and i got like maybe a minute in and then joseph came home and wanted to do something so i didn't okay, watch it say no day. more <laughs> um and so, god i think we played fallout instead <laughs> 
Sure. Um. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I okay. started it again yesterday and like I had, I mean, we were recording today. I had to get through it and it, it was painful. Okay. This stands apart like, a, a little bit like we've just said from pretty much the rest of the Disney canon. There's not too much more like this. And, and even mm-hmm. for the time it was coming out, it wasn't a Disney princess movie. It, um, the, the protagonist is not beautiful or cute or you know where we've had an aladdin as the lead it's difficult to support and the story itself is uh very different than a lot of others they do even in adapting it It, is it just that this is not necessarily the disney film you want it to be or the disney film from this era or or is this the film itself isn't good that's actually a really good question. My instinct is to say, no, it's just a really bad film. But then I start thinking about it and I realize that most of the issues that I have with it are because of the audience that Disney films are intended for, I think. Okay. And so I think the answer really is, I think it's just a bad Disney film. And if it wasn't a children's film, well, I can't see this film being done for any audience other than children. Like, I think if if someone adapted the source material and adapted it faithfully and it wasn't a cartoon and it didn't have talking gargoyles in it, then it probably would be perfectly fine. Some of the things that I think are problematic would still continue to be problematic because I know the source material is as well. But in a movie that's geared toward adults, that's a lot more forgivable, I think. And so when I'm looking at this movie and I'm seeing the rampant racism and misogyny and the lessons that children are being taught that's when I really start to have a problem with it. And so I think you're absolutely right that it is because it's a Disney movie that I can't give it a pass on these things. Okay. But yeah, even apart from just it being, oh, it's by Disney, so we expect certain things. I think trying to shoehorn it into a musical hurts this film in a number of ways. Mm -hmm. And like you say, the fact it has to deal with uh, elements of racism, elements of misogyny, elements of uh, sexual expectation. I don't know a good way to say that, but you know the the what is expected for everyone to appear and act and do in their within their society. Mm-hmm. I don't think it works. Certainly, as a Disney film, is there a way of doing it as a, as a children's film? Or something still dramatic, but with the levity and accessibility you might need. Oh, I'm not sure. To be honest with you. Yeah, I'm not sure. I, I read that the the creators of this, you know, very intentionally gave it a quote unquote happy ending so that it would be much different from the source material. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't think that's enough. No. Like I so I, I think honestly, I think that the source material for this just is not well suited to be adapted into a story for a children's audience. I, I really think that's the side that I'm coming out on, even though I haven't read the source material. Which makes me feel weird about saying that. I just can't figure out a way that you could be true to this story and still not be wildly inappropriate. Yeah. Okay. So that was a good show. Um, (laughs) (laughs) No, I I think we can discuss it, even though we're we're both saying kind of the same thing about it. It, It's not Mm -hmm. enjoyable as it is. But there is certainly conversation to be had about why and what we might do differently. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we can go over all the things we love about it. Uh... <laughs> hey, I have something in that. Yeah, in, I know. In, in that I, I'm sure I'll come up with something by the time we get there. Yes, yes. <laughs> okay. You talked about the misogyny and the racism. Do you want to delve into them a little bit? What stood out to you? Well, I mean, that's kind of the whole movie. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'm, so, I mean, can, the... can I phrase that in a different way? Yes. What is there that is. Uh, racist and misogynistic that is intentional as part of the story to show people who are racist or misogynistic or what is unintentional because it's not written perhaps as well as it could be. Oh, that's actually a really good distinction because I think (laughs) most, most of the things that I saw were intentional because it's coming from the source material. I mean, part of the story itself is that Frollo wants to wipe out an entire group of people just because of who they are. Mm. I mean, that's very intentional to the story. That's not the Disney writers are racist, so they wrote racist things. That's part of the story that Victor Hugo wrote. Um, I think 
one of the biggest issues that I have with it is using the term gypsy, because as we know, that is a racial slur against the Romani people. But at the same time, I didn't know that in 1994. Most people didn't know that in 1994. Most people who use that word up until probably the last 15 years used it because they were taught that is the name of this group of people. And so it was never intended to be racially motivated. Mm. But watching it through the lens of 2018 and hearing that be the only word used to describe this culture, it's just cringe-inducing. And so that one kind of skirts the line for me between is this intentional because of the story or is this unintentional casual racism? And I think it's leans more towards the second. Yeah, absolutely it does. I think because in in our lifetime, in our adult lifetime, it is becoming aware that this is a pejorative term. It, it is a racial slur mm-hmm. um, that you shouldn't use. It is absolutely fair for these characters to use it, except in a children's film. Right. <laughs> Again, it's the same point we, we've made up top, but uh, the, the easiest comparison is the N-word, which tells you a lot that we would actually say gypsy in talking about it, but the N-word is not something I'm going to pronounce. Right. For yeah. Yeah, reasons. But you wouldn't have a Disney film where people use that, even if they are set up to be racist. Right. Even if we're saying these are awful, awful people, you would not include that in there. And yet Gypsy still was and is littered throughout this. I think the the word Romani is used once and possibly only in a sort of initial voiceover exposition thing. Mm-hmm. So, Yeah, I think I did catch it once. Mm. But I think that at the very f- the first time we hear the word, it was, well, it was in the introduction when Frollo was chasing mm. uh, Quasimodo's parents. He was definitely using it very, very negatively. But then the next time we hear it is Esmeralda is using it as a Mm self-descriptor. And I think for them to have Esmeralda use it for herself is an indicator that this is not something that they were intending to do. That's why I'm I'm saying it's it's leaning towards casual racism Hmm. because they didn't do it intentionally to be racist. They did it because they didn't know any better. Yeah. And, And certainly, definitely within the U.S., it was a term that indicated a certain sort of lifestyle and attitude. It didn't necessarily mm-hmm. mean a culture. But yes. as the world has gotten smaller, we understand that absolutely, yes, it is. It, 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 yes. it is a slang slur in the UK and has been mm-hmm. for a very long time. But yeah, you do bump up against it now, don't you? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's definitely interesting to go back and see. You know, like like you said, the world has gotten smaller and, and so the things that we thought we knew 20 years ago, or I guess 30 years ago, God, I'm old, <laughs> are, are not the things that we know now. It's, mm. It is an interesting perspective. I think the thing that bothers me the most about this movie, though, is the the misogyny and the – I like the word, that, the, the phrase that you use, sexual expectation, which is not a phrase that you expect to use in conjunction with a Disney movie. <laughs> no, yeah. <laughs> like – Okay, so there's a song right smack dab in the middle of this movie called Hellfire. And it's sung by the villain, Frollo. And this entire song is about his lust over Esmeralda. He cannot control his desire of her. Therefore, it's her fault that he is sinning, so she must die. And he sings this song surrounded by literal fire because he's in front of a fireplace and he's caressing himself with her scarf like i was uncomfortable watching that as an adult okay and seeing this in a movie who the intended audience is children i just could not get past like what is this movie trying to say (laughs) What is this movie teaching the children who who are watching this? I mean, I understand that they, they painted Frollo as the villain. And so everything that he says and does is supposed to be bad. But for him to get an entire song that's about lust while he's caressing her scarf, mm. it just, it struck me as wildly inappropriate. I, I'm, I'm not sure where I fall on this line. Okay. Uh, okay, no. Let's go back. Let's just make sure I say this in the right way. Yes, it's inappropriate. Yes, what he's doing in the film is wrong. <laughs> um, and, and the character I see, <laughs> yes, it is wrong. However, 
in drama, they should represent people to challenge expectations, challenge your thoughts, and to present a mirror of, can you see this thing is wrong? Can we can we deal with it? So I don't have a problem with them presenting it and presenting it as an idea. And, and I'm sure I did read a thing that actually, although there were lots of people going, <gasps> won't someone think of the children? Actually, when they did screenings, kids were okay. Okay. And that's not me saying you're doing that thing, but it, it is the natural thing. Like, this is a kid's film. How do you... It is okay to present some challenging images, but also this is possibly a step too far. I, I, I'm i so in the middle of whether you should present this. Well, okay, let me let me see if I can clarify something. Well, and, and this just occurred to me about why I feel so uncomfortable with this. Because the only appearance of sexual expectation comes from Frollo Hmm. like it's never there's never a counter to the things that he's saying like it just doesn't exist outside of Frollo in this movie obviously he's having trouble because he thinks that she's a witch who you know stirs up desire in men but we don't ever see any sort of negation of that there's never somebody on the good side who says no that's not true we just ignore it as if it doesn't exist Mm. except what Frollo says and I think that's why I have a problem with it I think that you would need somebody to actively say or or show in some way that he's wrong not just that he's wrong because he's the villain of the piece and so obviously nothing that he says is true I think that the ideas that he puts forth like they actively combat his racism Because Quasimodo steps up for them, Phoebus changes his mind, you know, so they actively show both sides of that coin. Mm. But with Hellfire, they don't. And I think that's why it makes me so uncomfortable. Yeah, it is just accepted that she is a uh, sexual creature, a thing that is lusted after by all the men in the film, even the one who's supposed to be chaste and pure. And and he is the worst at it, and that is then what causes him to burn down Paris after. Right, mm. and and Disney actually went out of the way, I think, to. How do I want to say this? I think that if they had not had that scene of her pole dancing with the spear, mm. where the I mean, okay, so this was a very intentional choice. She pole danced with a spear, and every single male cartoon in that audience, was salivating over her. They intentionally completely over-sexualized her there. And so we get that scene first, and that's our introduction to her. And then that's followed, you know, later by this song by Frollo and and his expectations and and his experiences. And and so they, they feed off of each other. And so there's not ever somebody who says no she is not a witch who, you know, makes men's desires burn for her. She is not doing this. You are doing this yourself. Mm. You need to control your own thoughts and feelings and mind. And they just don't do that. They perpetuate the idea that she really is this overly sexualized creature. And I know that we've talked about that before with Disney films. Disney did it with the Jungle Book, with the 10-year-old child at the end. Yeah. But at least in, in that instance, they didn't later have – a grown man thinking about the fires of desire you know Mm. i don't know it just it bothered me like it makes me feel slightly prudish to be so (laughs) annoyed about it but at the same time oh the patriarchy that's all i've got Mm. it's the patriarchy and yeah it is absolutely fine to present a film that shows here is the damage done by the patriarchy and their lust after women but you do need to offer up the other viewpoints of it. And for me, what mm-hmm. stands out even more is not that the, the song hammers home the point, and it's it's part of my problem with the songs, but the bit where he grabs her and is sniffing at her hair. Oh, like, yes. oh, okay, this is the story they're trying to tell. Right, and they actually, they point that out. She's like, what are, what you, are you doing? doing? I was just imagining a rope around that beautiful neck. I know what you were imagining. Such a clever witch. So typical of your kind to twist the truth, to cloud the mind with unholy thoughts. Mm. And I'm like, did this movie really just go there? Mm. Like, children don't actually know what he's doing there. They shouldn't. And so 
if this is a movie for children, why would they include that? Yeah. This movie just skirts the line of gross Hmm. for me. Not in every way, but that particular plot thread, Mm -hmm. it it did not need to be in this movie. I don't know if it's in the source material. I'm assuming it probably is, since it's such a large part of this story. Yeah, so the the original story takes it even further. Um, oh, so 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 the the point is every man loves her. Our Lady of Paris, Esmeralda, everyone wants her. And she is sympathetic to Quasimodo, which is why he fo- ends up falling in love with her. Uh, although he he initially goes out to kidnap her uh, on the on the instruction of follow. <laughs> um okay. She falls for the captain in the same way she kind of does here, but he doesn't care about her. I think he's engaged or married or has a girlfriend or something. He doesn't care for her in the same way, but does agree to sleep with her and allows Follow to watch it happening for reasons that I'm not entirely clear on. Um, But then Follow gets too jealous when he sees what's about to happen and goes in and attacks the captain himself. So they take it even further that... uh, she is it is actively about physical lust for her it's not caring and wanting to spend mm-hmm. time and you know walks on the beach holding hands this is this is something she does to men because she is so beautiful and in the end as it turns out she's not actually uh, romani she was swapped with quasimodo at birth okay and there's a whole thing that he is and she isn't as it turns out i think hmm. yeah yeah okay Victor Hugo writes a lot of words. <laughs> the plot just spills out of him. <laughs> yeah, I think I just don't understand why that's a story that somebody decided we should adapt that into a Disney musical. Mm. That's the piece I just don't get. Let, let's dig into that. The musical for me is is the bit that really doesn't work. I, I think on, on the one hand, I, I've talked about this in the past, that I don't like musicals where the songs are not in service of the plot. Mm-hmm. They make a plot point and then they sing about it. And and I feel like pretty much every song in this is that sort of thing. It's oh I'd love to go out into the town ta- out into the town, so I'll sing out there. No, you should stay in the cathedral and I will sing about why. Oh I love this woman and let me sing about why. It it's hammering home a point rather than using the plot to evolve and show things actually happening. Right. But then also the songs themselves aren't great. They're not memorable at all. Yeah, I'm not sure whether it's memorable or fun or, uh, again, you... I, I Yeah, I can't link them to a moment in the film itself, so there's nothing that stands out there, which... Uh, and that, that is potentially fine. There are songs in The Lion King that do the same thing. Um, Just Can't Wait to Be King is pretty much one note. Scar's song that I can't even remember the name of, With the Highness Marching, that is, again, just him singing a dark song about being kind of evil. But because they're within this film that's fun and the songs themselves have things going on that are more memorable, more interesting, mm-hmm. they can be taken forward uh, and, and you do want to kind of hum them or listen to them in the car. Hunchback doesn't work on that level for me. No, not at all. Um, I had never heard a single one of these songs before, right. which surprised me. I know, you know, this month going through these Disney movies, with every movie that we've done so far, I have been surprised that there have been songs I didn't know, but there was always one or two songs that i had heard before Hmm. and in this one they were all absolutely foreign to me like i had never heard the melody i can't even tell you the names of the songs now except for hellfire but that's just because that one evoked some rage in me and and i looked it up so (laughs) yeah you see i have no idea if it if that would be right or not you could say anything (laughs) right now (laughs) yeah it's the song called damn that woman yeah i'd believe it about this film (laughs) 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 <laughs> <laughs> actually that that would be a good title for the sort of double use of dem yeah <laughs> you're not wrong you're not wrong so that's difficult and then the other side of it that for me hurts it is i think tom holtz would be a really good voice actor except his accent drives me bonkers in quasimodo here yeah, this this french deformed however old he's supposed to be 15, 20? 20. It, it, it is not congruous with the way Tom Holtz sounds. He's, he sounds like someone who is 5'6", you 5'8", know, and slightly manic and excitable and bouncing around. Uh, it, it doesn't work. Demi Moore, I think her voice probably works for the character, but at the same time I can only hear Demi Moore, and she's not that interesting to listen to. 
Yeah, I struggled with her. I felt like her voice is so distinct that I could not picture anybody but Demi Moore. And so she didn't work for the character. But I also feel like Demi Moore's voice was much older than Esmeralda was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And so when I was watching Esmeralda, like I just felt like I was watching a cartoon lip sync, honestly. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. Yeah, no, that's, that's a really good Demi, way to put Demi it. Moore just did not work for me for Esmeralda. Mm. Quasimodo, the acting was great. But I think, like you say, the, the voice itself, like the tone and timbre of the voice was not what I expected. It was much higher than I expected Quasimodo's voice to be. Mm. It was much lighter, I think. Because you expect... He's been raised in seclusion by an evil man. You expect him not to be happy yeah and he was just so happy the whole time yeah and i i don't know if that's a character choice from the writing standpoint or from the acting standpoint but it it was um there was a bit of cognitive dissonance for me there and you know he rings bells when he's right next to the bells he'd be very deaf (laughs) i can understand (laughs) not writing the character that way because it's difficult to portray and not that interesting necessarily but Mm -hmm. you know let's give us some real some realism in there yes let's put realism in a disney movie yeah exactly (laughs) (laughs) hey the accents pulled you out of uh, robin hood so (laughs) yes they did (laughs) and and i think because in in the few films before this we'd had some Celebrity casting, The Lion King, I think, was the heaviest of it. But we'd also, only a couple of years before, just had uh, Toy Story, which is the the mm. golden example for, hey, if you cast celebrities, you get these really great performances. And I think mm-hmm. this is then a sign of, oh, maybe not always. And maybe you do have to pick the right person rather than the biggest star. And I don't know whether it's mm. just because Mulan follows this, and that does not really have celebrities outside of Eddie Murphy. I think a, a short bit from George Takai. Mm-hmm. And I, d- I don't know whether that's because I am not familiar with the actors who themselves were famous in China and the Far East, or whether they Possibly. just were not so known in America. Right. I don't know. See, I'm, I'm questioning now whether, oh yeah, there were big celebrities, just not, a, not in the West, so <laughs> right. that's why you've not heard of them, Matthew. You know, expand what you watch sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't know, honestly. No. Um, I, I do think that the best character uh well not the best character but the best actor the best acted character in this was jason alexander doing hugo that was one of the one of the gargoyles, gargoyles. he was the, the fat gargoyle who was always eating the, the dude from seinfeld yes okay <laughs> whose name i do not know <laughs> jason alexander okay it's his name yeah uh, even he wasn't really doing anything different I mean, that was very much in the sidekick mold. The two of them, Victor and Hugo, felt very much like the demons from Hercules. Mm, okay. They, they were styled and did the same sort of comedy. Mm-hmm. Mm. The other thing I did quite like, because I, I looked to see if there was anything that was particularly reused in this, because we've kind of tracked that through the films we've watched. And, and there wasn't. This is now in the era where they're uh, using a lot of CG and using a lot of things to do some of that, both time-saving and introducing, in, introducing uh, sequences that they like. So there was nothing like the animation being reused that we saw in uh, some of the previous films. But mm-hmm. I did. there were a couple of times where like the baker in the beginning is... Pretty much the same baker from the beginning of Beauty and the Beast. Okay. Uh, the heretic who was locked up in the square is effectively Jafar in his old man disguise. It's almost the same model, just mm-hmm. with a different number of teeth. Right. Uh, the Some of the chase sequences use the same style of CG as Aladdin. I, I assume they obviously redid it, but it had that same kind of going down a corridor thing, uh, like mm-hmm. on the Magic Carpet ride. But the thing they did reuse that I had never realized until I looked it up is Belle has a like few frames in this of her walking down a street. I read that. I did not see it. No, I didn't. Um, I didn't go back and look. But they, they, I think I read that she was walking through the street in the opening number and she was mm. reading a book. Yeah. Um, and I think that somebody was shaking out a magic carpet. Okay, nice. In that same scene. Nice. But I absolutely... Because I was... That opening number, there was so much going on in it that I was overwhelmed from the start. Mm. So there was a lot that I was trying to understand, and I wasn't actually like paying attention to details. Yeah. 
You see, and that reminds me, just having moments like that, it reminds me of Rapunzel being in uh, Frozen. Just briefly, you mm-hmm. see her walking into the castle at one moment. Right. It has that, that very similar vibe to it, which is nice. Mm-hmm. We talked in Robin Hood a bit about how it was a beautiful film, it was all colourful, the animation was some of the best Disney had done, it was just a wonderful watch. I think that's the other thing that this loses, it's not particularly a colourful film, and they've done a lot on the backgrounds of using CG to fill out crowd scenes and so on, so it's not it's not got that sort of pop of the colour from having been hand-drawn or hand-coloured. Right, did, right, did, that makes sense. Yeah, did the visual stand out to you at all? Is there anything that you particularly... Uh, liked from it or that you were disappointed in no i think i mean the difference between this one and the previous movies that we've done though is that the previous movies were all outside in the forest and this was inside a stone city essentially so it was a lot of grays and muted blues Mm. and, and things like that there there wasn't a lot to bring color i mean esmeralda's costumes were very colorful uh when we did see the romani people they were very colorful Clopin, Clopan, I don't know how you say his name. Every time we saw him, it was all bright purples and reds. Right. But by and large, those were just very small pops of color among the gray mm. of everything else. And it doesn't have to be that way. You know, they could have done Nottingham Forest in Robin Hood as very drabs and browns and mud and darkness, but they, they made it green and bright and interesting. But in this, yes, they went it's green for, because it's a forest. Yeah, they went for a bit more natural, <laughs> very similar shoot. Yeah. Mm. I think going back, though, to you were talking about how you didn't see that they reused a lot of animation here the way they had in previous movies, mm. that, like we've talked about with the, the Xerox and, and all of that stuff. One thing that really, really stood out to me in this one, the entire time I was watching this movie, I was thinking... Frollo looks so familiar to me. Like, I could mm. not place it. It's like, it's weird because this is a cartoon, you know, and I know I've never seen this character before, but he looks exactly like somebody else that I've seen. And there was a scene towards the end during the final fight scene when it, it hit me. Okay. His face is almost identical to Cinderella's stepmother. Okay, right. Yeah, yeah. To the point where I Googled it to see if I was the only one who thought this, and I am not the only one who thinks this. There are people who have like put screenshots up side by side of them. And none of them use the one that I was thinking of specifically, so I may see if I can find that one, and, and I'll do a thing and post it. But, I mean, they are almost identical, which I think, I don't know if that was intentional or or what. Do we know if they had the same designer? No, it could be way too far apart, wouldn't it? Oh, yeah, because yeah. Cinderella was in the 50s. Because there are th- there are some kids in this who look so similar to the kids from Emperor's New Groove. And I've not looked it up, but it, it's that sort of stylized similarity that it's like, okay, it's the same person or team of people who drew them. Fine. Um, yeah, interesting. I wonder if they did use the similar model or, or, or looked back at fashions and they just ended up about the same. Yeah, mm. I don't know. Okay. Especially, I mean, because the, the two characters are very similar in temperament. But obviously one's male, one's female. Mm. But I don't know. They yeah. just, they look so similar to me. It was strange. Cool. Yes. I could yeah, be yeah, seeing yeah. connections that aren't there. But... I, I will absolutely do that. Nice. So what about this did you love? What would make this, make you come back for this if you had to? Okay, I'm sorry. Nothing is ever going to make me come back to this. If you had to watch this again, what would you be looking for as your shining light to get you through? My favorite me- moment in this uh, was actually one of the gargoyles. It was Laverne. So in the big fight at the end, she (laughs) starts telling the the pigeons to fly, my pretties. And it's got the (laughs) Wicked Witch's theme in the background with the, when she was doing the flying monkeys. Fly, my pretties, fly, fly. (laughs) I cracked up. I didn't expect it. It came out of nowhere and it just, it made my heart happy. Yeah, it's really good. (laughs) <laughs> it was really good, especially since they had had that beat with Laverne and the birds you know, throughout mm. of her. They were annoying her and she was trying to get them to leave her alone. And, and then she's just like, fly, my pretties. It's wonderful. Nice. But yeah, that was honestly the only thing I liked in this okay. movie. <laughs> yeah. Um, were you able to think of anything while we were talking? I think I, I pulled back from this when we were talking about the voice acting. Kevin Klein is exceptional in this. 
He is mm-hmm. very good. He is fun. He's interesting. Now, the character gets to do a lot of good stuff. But Kevin Klein's performance is as bombastic as it should be for a big uh, animated character. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I enjoyed him. I, I was trying to think. So, so you saying about the, the sort of reference pun with, with the pigeons and her being like the Wicked Witch. There are a few other moments like that, but I didn't enjoy them. So, so like the horse being called Achilles and him going, Achilles, heel. No, that doesn't work. No, that didn't work for you? No, not even a little bit. Did it work for you? Uh, I, <laughs> I'm i not as into puns as you are. So it honestly, it, I was just like, eh. I liked the horse because he sat on the bad people. And so he reminded me of uh, the horse in Rapunzel. Yeah, it is very Maximus in the same way that uh, Captain Phoebus is very Flynn Rider, or Flynn Rider is. Oh very... yeah, they had the like they they made Flynn Rider's smile after Phoebus's smile, right? Mm. Like they had the same grin. Yeah, yeah. Okay, just want to make sure I wasn't crazy. There oh, either. I don't know that they did, but absolutely yes, they are really similar. Yeah. Mm. Um, did you notice he he said uh, to Esmeralda? He said, "I didn't know you had a kid." Talking about the goat. Yeah. No, yeah, you don't like that either. Yeah, okay. No. <laughs> And I don't know why. I don't know if it's just that the, the joke itself is not strong enough or it doesn't have the charm to have brought me with it to that point. So I don't know. Okay. Yeah, Kevin Klein got me through it. David Ogden Steers was as good as he always is. But, mm-hmm. uh, you know, we enjoyed him in, oh, what what did we see him in? Leader and Stitch? Yes. And he'd previously done, is he something in Toy Story? I can't remember. He's in a lot. He's in, he's in at least one of the other ones, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he's in a lot of Disney voice mm. acting. Um, and I was unaware. For me, he's always going to be from MASH. Right. But I, I do think that we should take a minute to at least talk about why there are people who love this movie. Okay. To at least present that viewpoint, since clearly you <laughs> and I are on the same page and it's very negative about this. I mean, you're not you're not recommending this film, are you? I am, I am not, no. but there are people who do. Okay. Um, and so I just I want to take a moment to give some space to the other perspective, mm. because normally we are much more rounded on this. You know, one of us loves it. One of us doesn't. Or we both love it. It's rare that we both dislike something, mm. especially when there are people out there who absolutely love this movie. We have listeners who have told us well, that they love this movie. Th- this was the film that more people voted for us to watch than any other film. So yeah. thanks, guys. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I'm glad I watched it, honestly. Okay. okay. So I, I will link to this in the show notes, but someone wrote an article on Medium called Why the Hunchback of Notre Dame is one of Disney's greatest films. And I think that they really dive deep into all of the things that most people talk about whenever they talk about why they like this movie. So they're talking about how it has very unconventional characters for a Disney film. You don't get the princess. You you have a deformed protagonist in Quasimodo. You have a rebellious soldier. And so from up front, you know, it's not your standard Cinderella, Snow White kind of movie. It talks about how this, the villain of this movie is unlike villains that we generally see. Usually we get the witch or, you know, Jafar. Mm. But you don't get just a human with no magical powers who's being the bad guy. And in this one, we do. And so you kind of, it's telling children that sometimes the monsters look like you and me, which I think is a good moral. Absolutely. I can, I can agree that that's something that, that should be in a children's movie sometimes. It also talks about having, featuring a platonic love, like between Esmeralda and and Quasimodo is something that we've seen done so much more recently for example frozen it was about sisterly love not romantic love Mm. and they're saying hunchback did it first because of quasimodo and esmeralda we didn't actually talk about that plot line at all and i have issues with that one as well but a lot of people really enjoy that aspect of this movie i'm not sure that's platonic love from his perspective it was not absolutely from his perspective (laughs) and I really wish that Disney had not made the choice to dedicate an entire song to Quasimodo and the gargoyles telling him, of course you're worthy of love and of course she's going to love you when everybody knows that is not the direction this movie is going to go in. Mm. So this movie just hurt my heart in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. 
but that's neither here nor there. Okay. This review also talks about how this movie addressed darker matters, um, mastering the balance between fantastical innocence and the complexity of real life. You know, I'm just, I'm not going to go through all of these, but I think I'm going to read the conclusion because I think the conclusion really just kind of sums everything up. And I think it's what a lot of people think whenever they think about this movie. It says, perhaps this is the right time to revisit it and recognize the film for what it was, a bold story that challenged children to face the darkness in the world with bravery and kindness, a story that invites us all to raise our voice in the face of cruelty and bias. And while I don't entirely disagree with that, I think there are parts of the movie that absolutely do that. I think they are absolutely overshadowed by everything else that we've already talked about. And I think that's why I struggle with it. But there are a lot of people who see the good and see that this is not the traditional romance, fall in love at first sight kind of movie. And so it started a change in the traditional Disney movie. And I think that's fantastic. Mm. I just have a different perspective. Yeah, I, I think I can appreciate those points. But I'm not sure it works, and I'm not sure it's the right choices to have made. I struggle with it. I honestly, I think the problem is the source material. It, it, I don't yeah. know that that you can actually adapt this source material into a movie that is appropriate for children, mm. especially at the end. I mean, they they do try to stick to some of the key plot points of the original story, such as him pouring molten lead on the street from the top of the cathedral. Not sure they should have included that. <laughs> that's that's perhaps a little far for a Disney film. Um, yeah, yeah. All right, yeah. So I will I will link to that article in the, in the show notes just so that we are presenting another perspective Fair from our own. Um, I I would like to take a step back and talk a little bit about Disney films in general. Having watched okay. four classic Disney's, um, are, are you pleased? Are you, are, you, are you pleased to have done this and watched these different films? Oh, absolutely. Honestly, I'm still shocked at the number of Disney movies that I haven't seen. Although thinking about why I probably haven't seen them makes more sense to me now. But this is something that absolutely needs to be remedied. And I think there are enough left that we can continue to do Disney movies moving forward. And and not all of them are, you know, front liners. You know, we've got things like The Sword and the Stone, The Fox and the Hound. Those are not Cinderella level movies, but they're still Disney movies, you know. I love that Cinderella is your go-to. The Disney Cinderella film. is absolutely yeah. yeah. Cinderella is my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> um, of the four that we've watched, is there one that stood out that you've enjoyed the most? I, I was thinking about this question, and I've, I've obviously I've had negative things to say about all of them, and I I think a large part of that is just coming to it from the perspective of an adult in 2018 watching these movies. But I think the one that I absolutely enjoyed the most even though I found it wildly problematic, was The Jungle Book. Okay. Because I love Baloo. Right. I do. Baloo just makes that movie for me. So is that the one you'd you'd either recommend or go back and watch? I think so. Okay, nice. Yeah, Snow White is just... It's just very meh, which I think is exactly what I said when we recorded that one. Yeah. Um, And Robin Hood just wasn't that interesting to me. So the Jungle Book is the one that had, you know, more of the fun songs. It kept me going, even though it really didn't have a good plot. It still had fun characters, at least. Yeah. And we didn't really get that in any of the other ones. Okay. So I think Snow White of of these four is the one I'd say, oh, that's the strongest or the best. But I think because I watch it from a technical standpoint and go, oh, -hmm. they do some good stuff in this film. Oh, yeah. From a technical standpoint, I would actually absolutely go back to snow white just because it was groundbreaking Mm. i mean it it was a fantastic movie it was done fantastically but from a story perspective snow white is just so overly pervasive okay and i I think that's why i keep shying away from that one Mm. i don't know okay so of the ones that were remaining on the list, is there anything that you now look at? And exactly like you say, we've got some interesting ones on there. We've got uh, some big hitters, Peter Pan, Bambi, Alice in Wonderland, Sleeping Beauty. And we've got some mm, greater or lesser, you know, Dumbo, Pinocchio, Great Mouse Detective. 
Is there anything on there now that stands out that you go, actually, yes, I'd like to watch more films from this era or that have this reference in, in the Disney canon? Um, Looking at it from that perspective, no. Okay. Um, and, I mean, none of the movies that we watched made me think, oh, I know that there's another one that's like this that I want to watch. And, and that's probably just me because I don't actually know when any of these came out. I know Lady and the Tramp was before Robin Hood, but that's because we talked about right. it. <laughs> To me, Disney movies are just kind of, they're Disney movies. It doesn't matter when they came out. It's a Disney movie. Mm. Looking at the list that we have left, I think um, I am interested in Dumbo, but largely that's because the live action remake is getting ready to come out. Mm. And so I would like to be able to say at some point that I've watched both. Okay. You know, we did the Jungle Book, and so at some point I'm going to do the Jungle Book live action one, and mm. so it, it would be nice to do that. I can't wait to see the live action Mulan. I mean, I love Mulan. That's not on the list because I've seen it a dozen times, yeah. probably more than a dozen times. But the ones that do have that live action counterpart now are, are ones that I'm interested in because I like seeing how these stories are done differently in 2018 okay. or 2017 or, or whatever. Of the rest, I think I'm interested in Alice in Wonderland. Mm. And that's probably all. Okay. I mean, it, it, I, I, that's not to say I, I refuse to watch the others. I absolutely yeah. would. They're just not super high on my list. Okay. It, it's interesting. I think at least half of these are kind of English stories. So I wonder if that's why some of them I look at and go, oh, no, of course that's a major one. Alice in Wonderland, Peter Pan, Sword in the Stone, A, a Great mm-hmm. Mouse Detective, which is a riff on Sherlock Holmes. I wonder if there is something about their appeal or their popularity over here. Mm, mm. I don't know. Because, see, to me, The Sword in the Stone and The Fox and the Hound are not big Disney movies. And that could just be because I just don't know. Maybe they were at a time before I was really aware of Disney movies. Mm-hmm. But they're not ones that I see referenced. Right. Like Cinderella is the one that I keep coming back to because I think that was my first Disney movie. And... To me, Cinderella is the ultimate Disney princess. And so when I think Disney, that's who I think about. And she's everywhere. Snow White is also everywhere. Belle is everywhere. I don't even know what the Fox and the Hound is about. The Sword and the Stone, I mean, that's about, I assume, Merlin and King Arthur. Yeah. Or, in or in Arthur, some shape, form, or yeah, fashion. Arthur, but... Right. Mm. But but those are not ones that I've ever heard people talk about or reference. I don't know what the characters even look like because I haven't seen them. Okay. I haven't seen pictures of them or anything. And, of course, I'm I'm saying because I haven't done it, obviously, it's not a big thing. <laughs> yeah. Right? Because it's all about me. <laughs> okay. So we'll keep the, the list live and, and maybe return to it. Maybe we do this uh, at Disney Month again at some point. We could probably do that. Yeah. Or, or would you rather scatter them through? I think at this point I would rather scatter them through because looking at that, I'm not sure that I would enjoy doing four of those in a row. Right. Okay. But I've really enjoyed this Disney month. Mm -hmm. Nice. It's been fun. It has been fun. And I am glad that I can now say that I have seen such classics as Snow White. Yeah. And The Jungle Book. You know. Yeah. They they are pretty significant films in in, uh, the last hundred years or so. Yeah. Yeah, they really are. Good. And so four Disney films has been a, a good build-up to your birthday. Yes. So happy birthday, Miss Mandy. Oh, thank you. Everyone, hashtag, best hashtag wins. I don't know what, but you do. <laughs> <laughs> what did we do last year? Was it just Mandy Kay's birthday? Uh, MK's birthday? I don't ha- remember. Birthday, we did MKO something. or something, I think. Yeah, yeah, I don't remember, but thank you. <laughs> Yeah, it's been great. I like getting to pick what we do around my birthday. And last year, I just picked the one that came out that week. And this year, I was like, nope, I get the whole month. Nice. So thank you for indulging me. I appreciate it. Okay. Oh, Disney, it's always good. Uh, it's it's <laughs> mostly good. Because I, I didn't talk about when I saw Hunchback. Um, a, a few years ago, actually, we, we spent a few days at uh, Disney World. And we had an amazing time. And both before and after, we tried to catch up on the Disney films that we hadn't seen. In a, in a similar sort of way. So I watched the ones that uh, were particularly important in the canon that I'd missed, and Hunchback was one of them. Okay. And I remember watching and then going, okay, now I've seen it. <laughs> and it's difficult because when you're catching up, you're also watching some great films. So I'd never seen, yeah. I'd never seen Princess and the Frog before. That's a good film. I still haven't seen that one. Really? Really? Okay, that needs to go on the list. That is a solid film. 
Okay. Yeah, that's good. I assumed it wasn't on the list because you'd seen it because it's a modern Disney princess film. No, that uh, that's why it's not on the list. Is because it's more modern. Set in the South. This takes every know. interest you have. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I am actually, I'm looking up because we had, uh, for Snow White, we had Nichelle on the show and she and her husband had done all of the Disney movies and ranked them. Mm -hmm. I want to see where they ranked Hunchback. Mm. They both agreed that Hunchback was in one, they were objectively both in the 10 worst Disney films. (laughs) So hers was 10th from the bottom and his was third from the bottom. So she put him at 64 and... He did it at 71. Right. Okay. Okay. Cool, cool, cool. <laughs> All right. Interesting. Okay. It's not just us. That's the good thing. Yeah. It's yeah. not just us. I think, I feel like this movie is polarizing. I feel like you either love it or you don't. Mm. I'm not sure that there's a middle ground here. And people are I could be wrong. It, yeah. So if someone is indifferent to it and, and falls in that middle space, I would love to hear from you. Mm. And I'd also really like to hear from the folks who love this movie, um, because I would like to know, apart from the, the things that I did talk about from that article, I would I would like to know from our listeners why, like, what am I not seeing hmm. that, that other folks are that, that make this a classic for them? Constructively. Don't just at us. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, I, I honestly, I want to know, because all I see when I look at this is is negative and so i would really like to know what i'm missing Mm. if you would like to join the conversation you can use the hashtag pc deprived on twitter you can find us on twitter facebook and instagram at eloquent gushing or you can send us an email at podcast at eloquent gushing.com you can find both of us on twitter i'm at mandy k and i'm at matthew vose we are 100 percent funded by listeners like you through patreon anything you can give gives access to exclusive content and helps to support the network and develop our other shows to find out more please visit patreon.com slash eloquent gushing and don't forget to visit the homepage eloquentgushing.com where you can find all the other shows and blogs that we do on the network we'll be back next week with another episode where we'll talk about the 1967 television show the prisoner until next time i'm mandy k and shall we review your alphabet today (laughs) that rhymed Yes, 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 it did. Happy birthday. <laughs> Wait, did you pick it on purpose to rhyme? No. Okay. I just like that it tickled you. <laughs> yes, it tickled me. Pop Culturally Deprived is an Eloquent Gushing production. For more information, please visit eloquentgushing.com.